Hello, everybody. Welcome to UPAVE's eighth workshop on best practices on outdoor, industrial, and heavy duty concrete pavements. My name is Luke Renz. I'm managing director of UPAVE, the European uh, Concrete Paving Association. We exist since uh, 2007. And we have a triple mission. First, we want to advocate and enable the wider use of cement and concrete applications in Europe, also, uh, uh, let's say, around the world, but mainly in Europe, European transport infrastructure. We want to do this by engaging with uh, our stakeholders, the EU institutions, also national and local decision makers. We want to spread the know-how, the technical know-how we have on concrete roads, concrete pavements, and communicate on the benefits of them. And finally, we also want to promote uh, innovative techniques and best practices in the sector. That's why we came up to the idea about 10 years ago to organize this kind of workshops on best practices. As you can see, we started uh, with our first edition in 2015. Uh, talking about the evenness of concrete pavements. And so about every year we had uh, one edition with uh, several topics. We talked about joints, concrete mix. We talked about roller compacted concrete pavements, concrete pavement preservation, pervious concrete pavements, and recently at the end of last year uh, on concrete overlays. Uh, of course, yeah, during the COVID period, we switched from the live workshops to the, the hybrid version. I think this is already the, our fourth edition in, in, in a hybrid format. So live with uh, people here in the room. Hello, everyone. And also with uh, lots of people online uh, uh, attending our workshop remotely. So good afternoon. You see that most of those topics are dealing with uh, roads, but we are aware since the, the, the start of UPAVE that there is also another uh, big market for concrete pavements. And those are indeed those, the kind of industrial, commercial pavements and also the heavy duty uh, pavements. We, we had not forgotten about them, but of course, it, yeah, it, it took some time, but now we, we said it is time to uh, do something on that topic and to take it as uh, the team for this uh, eight workshop. And that's how we came to uh, the following program. After my introduction, I will stay here in front for the first presentation, which is basically a general introduction with some let's say, general statements, an overview, and also in a comparison in, in to what extent that those uh, outdoor industrial and heavy duty concrete pavements, or to what extent are they similar or different from uh, concrete roads in terms of uh, mainly design and, and construction. In my presentation, I will not go too deep into detail about uh, the, the theoretical design. But after me in the second presentation by uh, Dr. Anna Bildens from Abbey Roads, we'll get some more details about the theoretical design. But she will also show some, uh, uh, some case studies uh, and also some failures uh, to learn uh, how to build correct uh, durable pavements. A third presentation uh, before the coffee break will be by Professor Halil Ceylan. Uh, also very interesting topic on the critical load arrangement of stacked containers because yeah, we will talk a lot about those uh, container terminals today because that's uh, really a, a typical heavy duty uh, pavement. Uh, 
and in that presentation, and he will also make the link with roller compacted concrete pavements. So that's also very interesting. So those are the first uh, three presentations. First two are live. The third is pre-recorded. We have two pre-recorded uh, presentations. Uh, however, the speakers will be available for the, the Q&A, so uh, everyone can ask uh, questions to Halil Silan. Also to Mr. Myron Hillock, uh, who will give the first presentation after the break. Um, uh, he's from uh, Somero, uh, a manufacturer of equipment for leveling and, and uh, curing of uh, also concrete floors, concrete floors and pavements, so that's uh, very interesting. And uh, the last presentation by our, our Dutch colleague uh, Jeroen de Vriese, he will show uh, a very nice example about the container exchange route in, in Rotterdam, in, in the port. And he will also explain more, not just about the technique, but also the reasons behind yeah, why did we choose concrete uh, for this very particular project. There's a bit time left for questions uh, and answers at the end. Uh, and of course, for everyone who's here, we will close with uh, some cocktails with a small reception. Uh, okay, I think that so we are ready now to end this introduction. And so I can switch immediately to my first presentation. Titled Design and Construction of Industrial Pavements, the Comparison with Road Pavements. As you can see, I'm not only Managing Director of UPAVE, also Consulting Engineer for FIBELSEM, the Belgian Cement Association. So my main experiences uh, are, let's say, not only on European, but mainly on, on the Belgian field. So I will also show some cases, examples, uh, yeah, mainly from Belgium. As we said, those outdoor, industrial and heavy-duty concrete pavements, yeah, I, I put it all together in acronym OIHDCP to make it a bit shorter in my presentation. Well, you can see that we can have very different types and, and it goes from all kinds of commercial zones. And in those commercial zones and, or in industrial areas, we have uh, different applications. You also have access roads, access roads maybe for light vehicles, for heavy vehicles, which is, uh, can be different. You have the, the loading and unloading areas. You have the, those uh, docks, storage and work areas, uh, parkings. Uh, so you can see that we have very different functions, sometimes with very different requirements. And of course, there are the very typical heavy-duty pavements, which we mainly find in port areas. Uh, and then, yeah, it's either the uh, container handling, but uh, also, also the, the, the brake goods, uh, the small, very heavy pieces sometimes. And another typical pavements are the, the airports, airports where we can make uh, the difference between mainly the runway, taxiway, and the apron. I think it's mainly the apron, which is, let's say, the, the parking places for the airplanes, which uh, suffer the most from the, the heavy loads from the airplanes, which are the real heavy-duty pavements. It's less the case for the runways, because on, on the moment that uh, an airplane is, is taking off or it's landing, it still has some lift and, and, uh, and the loads on the pavement are often not that much, except, of course, for the braking. And of course, within a uh, commercial area, you can have a combination of different functions. I give you here the example of a, a joint layout plan that I've prepared. It's a, a didactical uh, example where I put yeah, a parking for heavy goods vehicles. There can be a parking for light vehicles. There can be a building and the access roads. And as I said, uh, it's it's 
different functions we're talking about different kind of, of, of loading for the heavy goods vehicles sometimes it's good to have uh, dowel joints maybe that is not really necessary for the parking for the light vehicles or around the building so just to tell you that uh, there are different functions with different requirements now we talked about outdoor and we we have uh, integrated the, the term outdoor in the title because we know that of course we also have a lot of indoor internal concrete floors and yes that's also a huge and an, an important market for the concrete industry but it's not totally the same as the the outdoor pavement and in the first place then we think about uh, I'm going to show you a few differences. Uh, in the first place, we think about the exposure conditions, obviously. Uh, outdoor, indoor, it's, it's, it's different. For the external pavements, they are exposed to, the, to greater temperature changes. And we know all that temperature has uh, a big impact on design of concrete. Uh, the thermal stresses play an important role. So we have greater changes both on, on a daily basis and also between seasons, summer, winter changes. Uh, mm -hmm. That makes a difference. And we have the, diff the exposure to uh, snow, rain, hail, frost, the freestow effects and related to frost and freestow, we also have the use of the icing salts, uh, which we is... Uh, uh, quite an aggressive factor for uh, concrete surfaces. Um, we use a lot of the icing salts on roads, but also on, on other trafficked places. We don't use them for internal floors. However, we have to pay attention in some cases when vehicles come from outside and they drive into uh, a car park, well, there will be the icing salts carried with the tires and you still have the risk uh, of scaling of the surface, as you can see on, on those uh, pictures. Just and simply due to the, the icing salts that are uh, brought with uh, the tires. And with the rain and the snow, of course, in, in an outdoor structure, you also have the, the, the risk uh, of potential ingress of the water into the structure. Uh, we know that uh, water sometimes can be very detrimental uh, in combination with uh, heavy loadings, especially if the water is trapped somewhere in the structure and can create pumping effects. Normally that's not the kind of problem that we have for internal floors. Another difference is the surface finishing technique. For an internal floor, we want to have it uh, nice, bright, shiny, easy to clean. And that means that mostly they are uh, finished by power floating, by troweling. And, and it's also suitable for the, the, the, the vehicles with small wheels, also for, for the forklift, the comfort uh, of the use of forklifts uh, internally. Uh, for an external pavement, that is not really a good solution because it can uh, get too slippery. I will show you an example of that later in my presentation. Also in terms of uh, surface regularity, uh, the evenness of the surface, there is a difference because sometimes for internal floors you can have really very strict requirements and that's due to the uh, operations of the, the handling materials handling equipment for the high racking systems uh, so of course the higher it is the the, the fewer uh, or the smaller the tolerances are or uh, on unevenness of, of the floor normally let's say of course we also have uh, requirements on on evenness smoothness for uh, roads and uh, external pavements but mostly they are not, let's say, that strict as uh, indoor. So we can say they look alike, but they are still very different. An internal concrete floor, it's not the same as an external concrete pavement and vice versa. Be, uh, we're telling, we're starting with this statement because what we sometimes, or sometimes maybe too much uh, can see 
is that techniques for internal floors are used for uh, external pavements and that can lead to uh, problems, uh, to distresses and, and early damage. So, let's now start to compare our industrial and heavy duty pavements with the concrete roads. What is similar and what is very different? Well, a road is a long stretch, it's uh, linear and long, mostly. Uh, of course, I know in the United States sometimes you have up to, to 10, 12 lanes, but uh, Mostly it's, it's, let's say, for the motorways, sometimes limited to two, three, four. While those industrial concrete pavements, well, it's, it's more a local area. It's, it's in all directions, often as, as a square shape or uh, irregular shaped. It's often very large, not always, but it can be very large. But then we're not talking about really kilometers long, but mainly about... An, um, you one, two, three hundred meters long. So often we talk about uh, large rectangular surfaces. However, I show you on the photo an example of uh, yeah, an, an industrial pavement with, with some uh, small, more difficult area. I will show more photos of that later on. On the road, is intended to uh, carry the traffic. Traffic is a uh, dynamic load. Um, we know that if you want to design a concrete road, it's not the light vehicles, it's not the passenger cars that really play a role. It it's, it's only starts from, let's say, something li like about uh, uh, three and a half tons. It's the heavy vehicles, they are the ones that uh, are determining the thickness, the design of uh, a concrete pavement. But so mainly uh, dynamic loading by vehicles. Vehicles which we can also see on our industrial pavements and our, on our heavy duty pavements. But then we see not only those, uh, those trucks coming, but also uh, some forklifts, uh, which also can be quite heavy. Often combined with static loadings, uh, materials that are stored on, on the concrete. Uh, in the photo below here, I show you here that those are uh, steel plates, steel plates which are positioned on uh, some pieces of wood. So, so it's, it's quite a concentrated load. Uh, we see here the example of the, the, of the forklift of smaller vehicles. In some cases, we have very uh, specific loadings, like, of course, on the airfields, you have the airplanes, then uh, it's the, the, the, the type of the, the landing gear and the tires that, that will, of course, determine all the stresses in the concrete pavement. I'm not going too much in, into detail about that. So for the heavy-duty concrete pavements, the static load loads, uh, they can be yeah, well distributed over a surface, they can be linear, sometimes you can have uh, point effects. Uh, then then can be a risk for uh, punching shear failure, so you have to limit the contact pressures. Normally it's about uh, 7 newton per square millimeter is really a maximum. Uh, let's say below one, it's, it's not really uh, determining, then it's more the, the heavy vehicles that, that will count. A uh, particular case of uh, static loadings are the stacked containers, but we'll hear more about that later on in the presentation of Professor Ceylan. Um, Of course, even those distributed loads can come very become very high. And we all know that uh, for a concrete slab, uh, the dangerous parts are at the edges or the sides. So it's good to stay away from the joints. So if you stack your materials, it's good to take into account also the, the, the joint layout, not to put the, the too heavy loads uh, too close uh, to the joint. Uh, uh, here, here below we see a good example of a heavy crane with, uh, where the static point load is distributed over a, a surface, so that, that's uh, a good solution. 
for the heavy duty concrete pavements, we also have the dynamic loadings, heavy goods vehicles. Well, normally that's about uh, the 130 kilonewton in Belgium, sometimes a bit less, a bit more. Tire pressure around 0.7 newton per square millimeter. We have those forklifts, some below or sometimes over 100 kilonewton, well, 10 tons. Uh, for the containers, we have the very specific equipment, uh, the kind of cranes, the straddle carriers, the reach stackers. Uh, they are the. I see. Oh, yeah. Th this is not. It's it's uh, for the straddle carriers that we see. The, the, my 1100 kilonewton of front axle that's here for the container handling equipment, w which is sometimes possible. Th this is really extreme, but also for the handling of brake good. Uh, as, uh, as you can see here, this is also uh, a coil. It's, it's about 100 ton on, on a, a small a trailer with very small hard wheels. So then you get a really high I loading, a, a, a very high contact pressure. And then in addition, when they drop this uh, wheel on, on the concrete, you have the, the shock or the impact loading. Uh, so that makes it all uh, very hard to withstand. And that makes that for th these kind of pavements, you, you really have to look the limits of, uh, in terms of thickness and reinforcement to uh, abrasion resistance and, and so on to withstand those uh, extreme loads. Some design aspects, as I said, I will not go into detail of theoretical design. I will just uh, discuss a few of the parameters. And one is the design life, because if you want to design it, you first need to know for which service life you want to design. A service life is the period during which there will be no really structural maintenance. However, you always have to do the the maintenance which is necessary, preventative and curative. Even if it's limited, even if it's just filling of the joints, that still needs to be done. Now for concrete roads where mostly the owner, the operator or uh, as a public road authority, I know we also have uh, concessionaires, uh, but mostly it's, it's a public road authority and we're looking at, uh, at least for concrete roads, at a service life of 30 let's say at least to preferably 40 years and, and for uh, if, if the traffic volume is not too high, even up to 50, 60, 70 years of service life. For the commercial industrial pavements, yes, that can be the same approach because after all, it's good to have a long life pavements. After all, it's very beneficial in terms of uh, life cycle cost, also in terms of environmental impact. It's very good. However, the owners of those uh, pavements, uh, operators, uh, sometimes are private companies and they're also looking at the and maybe too much at the initial inv investment, so cost may play a role. In addition, sometimes the loading can be so high that it is economically, economically and technically difficult to, to build the, the, the pavement that's wrong, that they prefer to uh, start from a shorter service life. So it can be shorter, but Let's assume that a minimum of 15 years is, is, uh, is to be put forward. Uh, fif 15 years, yeah, if, if you really want to build a, a heavy duty concrete pavement, so if, if it's less, maybe uh, you shouldn't do it. The choice of pavement type. For the concrete roads, we have the, the whole range. The jointed plain concrete pavements or the concrete slabs, yeah, mostly used all over the world and, and uh, for a good reason. But for heavily trafficked uh, roadways, we also have CRCP, continuously uh, reinforced concrete pavements, uh, as in Belgium here. Most of our motorways are built in, in CRCP. And uh, during Let's say the last decade, there's also a huge development of roller compacted concrete pavements. 
uh, mainly in the United States, also thanks to the RCC Pavement Council. They're really promoting and, uh, this technique and developing it, improving it. So, but until now, mostly that's for uh, secondary roads. If we look at our industrial and heavy duty concrete pavements, we can say, well, we only see JPCP. So we see only see concrete slabs. That's However, almost only because there are some cases, we have some exceptions in CRCP. And today we will show some cases. There will be one example in the presentation of Anna Bilden, and the whole presentation of my Dutch colleague Jeroen de Vriese will be about the use of CRCP. So it is possible. And also, roller compacted concrete is uh, really a, a good solution for this type of pavements. Uh, and we'll hear also hear more about that in the presentation of uh, Alil Ceylan. So yes, uh, you see there is a kind of a, a development towards the, the other pavement types. But after all, uh, the main, the, the basic solution is, is uh, the jointed and mostly doweled uh, uh, plain concrete pavement. And we will talk about uh, mainly about that. Regarding the pavement structure, uh, this is a general structure, whether it's for a road or for an industrial pavement with the loading carried by the concrete slab. Uh, we have a base layer, and between the base layer and the concrete slab, the number two is a sandwich or a profiling layer or, or, or a membrane or a plastic sheet. Uh, below the base layer, we have the sub-base, uh, a geotextile, and the sub-grade. Uh, the industrial concrete pavements, what we often see, and it's typical in Belgium, we see that uh, often the requirements for the base layers are less strict. Right? For instance, they will use uh, an unbound mixed granular layer, so using also the, a mix of uh, concrete and brick or rubble. Um, now, why? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's good in terms of uh, recycling. Yeah, obvious, it's good. And in addition, the loadings uh, in, in the, those commercial areas, the traffic loadings, are, after all, lower than what we see on the highways. And I'm not just talking about the intensity. Uh, trucks are not always fully loaded. But also the frequency, uh, because uh, you cannot imagine the, the, the same number of trucks driving over this uh, commercial pavement like we have on a motorway uh, where we can have up to yeah, sometimes uh, 10, 20, 30,000 heavy vehicles uh, a day driving over the, the, the right lane. Now again, the initial price here also uh, plays a role in, in, in the choice. Yeah. Uh, it also means that mostly there is no sandwich layer, no geotextile. Uh, in terms of concrete thickness, it's not that much different from the roads. In general, we're using conventional thicknesses between something like uh, 18 and 25 centimeter. Always depending on the loading, depending on the service life, depending on the soil and, and, and so on. For the real heavy-duty concrete pavements, the intensity of the loading can be really extreme, can be very high. Uh, you see I already mentioned here this case of a uh, really heavy coil, about 70, 80 tons on, on this trailer. It can be very high, but the frequency is again low. So when for roads, the design is mostly based upon fatigue resistance with a fatigue low, this is not really valid for the, in case of those low frequencies. And then in the design procedure, it's better to use a safety factor on the loading or a safe or an safety factor on the material characteristics. And if necessary, also a, a dynamic coefficient. N of the base layer is uh, really uh, getting more important here. Uh, and of course, also the concrete thickness. 
And that means that for this kind of heavy duty concrete pavements, whether these are for container handling, whether it's for uh, import or airports, then we can see thicknesses going up to 30, 35, 40, sometimes even more in centimeters. Um, for those heavy duty pavements, I also believe that a sandwich layer between the base layer and the concrete layer is to be considered, I say. And let me go a little bit more into detail. Uh, if you have this kind of uh, base layer, if whether it's a granular or uh, whether it's hydraulically bound, when you have to level it, you should really not do it with a material that uh, cannot resist washing out or erosion. Uh, you cannot level it just with a layer of sand. That's not good. For us, the best solution, and that's the experience that we had from uh, in, in our history with CRCP, is that an asphalt layer between a hydraulically bound base layer, like lean concrete, and the hard uh, top of the uh, pavement concrete, that that is the best solution, because that asphalt layer will prevent the erosion of the base layer, also prevents reflective cracking, uh, cracks that would go up from the base layer to the pavement. It also creates bond uh, between the layers, that will be explained later in the next presentation also. And also very good is it's an even a comfortable working platform, especially when you have to install reinforcement and I didn't include much about reinforcement in, in my presentation, but um, I can say that most of those industrial concrete pavements, they are reinforced uh, either with uh, a mesh reinforcement or with uh, bores, steel bores or uh, glass fiber reinforced polymer. So asphalt layer seems the very best solution. In practice, we often, seen, we often see that for commercial uh, areas that they use a plastic sheet. A plastic sheet, okay, it's good because that prevents that water is extracted from the concrete uh, to the bottom. However, it's also good because uh, it, it creates a, a sliding layer and a, a sliding plane, and so it reduces stresses. But after all, it's not so good because it means that for uh, a concrete slab, for the first uh, joints uh, or cracks, the first joints that will crack through, that are created, they will end up opening too wide and other joints will not function. And then you see that the pavement starts to work in blocks of five slabs. Uh, and that is to be avoided. That's why we think if there is a risk of uh, loss of water from the bottom of the pavement, that is better to moisten, slightly moisten the base layer before concreting. And maybe a solution in between is a geotextile, an unwoven geotextile, because that also prevents erosion and reflective cracking and does not really create that uh, uh, slip uh, plane like the, the plastic sheet. few words about construction techniques, uh, slip form paving, which we all know is the best solution, but you can only use it when your section is long enough. Well, for a road, mostly it is long enough, but also for an industrial pavement, it can be long enough. Sometimes you also have uh, 100, 150, 200 meters, well then you can use uh, a slip form paver. Um, the advantages are the efficiency, mm -hmm. the very good compaction by the set of slip for, um, mm, vibrators, <coughs> the needle vib vibrators, and which results in, let's say, the best quality concrete you can get. For an industrial pavement, you have several lanes, one next to another, and so the best and um, common technique is first to build the uneven strips, uneven lanes, and then the even ones, as you can see here on the photo, also here. Of course, you have to be aware that 
if you go concreting in between two already built strips, that okay, then it's no longer slip forming. Uh, but then that you still have to maintain the good quality of the, the concrete, not add the too much water, uh, not to increase the consistency. Because, yeah, the same is true for the uh, heavy duty concrete pavements, because then we are facing very thick concrete slabs, making it somehow more difficult to, with regard to the edge slump, so you really need a good stiff mix. And it can be sometimes so challenging that a contractor will prefer to use a slip form paving machine, but to build a lane between fixed formworks. And that's what you can here see here, the slip form paving machine and the fixed formworks which are installed here. And so, uh, this is on Brussels National Airport, construction of, of an apron. And so, of course, that avoids the problem of uh, the, the, the edge slump. Now, uh, just a small example. I said that the uh, slip form paving, you, you need uh, large projects, large sections. Well, this is here an example where uh, it's a contractor who built his own uh, pavement around this new building and so he had the will and he had the skills to do it so even for a smaller job so you see the even uneven lanes in, uh, in blue and green and in red you have the parts that had to be concreted by hand and you see it was not not such a big job uh, small lanes around the building but you can see that he can do it he also used a special slip form paver with the tracks uh, within the, the width of the concrete strip. Uh, just to be able to, uh, to do this. Of course, sometimes slip form paving is not possible for the smaller areas uh, in intersections and, and in curbs maybe. Uh, yeah, both for roads or for industrial pavements, that is possible. Then compaction can be done by the poker vibrators or vibrating screed, which can be a light one or a heavy one. But there's another technique, and that's what we often see, uh, at least here in Belgium. That's where the uh, another type of concrete is used, a pumped concrete. Uh, with uh, a more fluid concrete, hmm, where sometimes the concrete is no further compacted with vibrators because they think it has been consolidated with a travel surface. It has the advantage uh, that it goes very, very fast, so it's a high efficiency, makes that it's a low cost, so it becomes very interesting for owners uh, who want to build a concrete pavement. But there is a problem because you have to pour the, the concrete in, in its fluid state and before you can come with your floating machine you have to wait about four, five, six hours before the concrete is dry and hard enough to, to, to do it. But it means that during that period the concrete is there left unprotected, exposed to uh, the weather conditions. Yeah, of course it's, it's, a, it's a cloudy weather and, and a bit mi then, then, and add a bit of fog, then, then it's fine. But when it's uh, really a lot of sun and wind, then it's, it's not so good, and you risk uh, to have some plastic cracking or other problems later on. But you don't necessarily have to pump it, you don't necessarily have to uh, use this fluid concrete. It can also be done with a stiffer concrete, which then can be compacted, leveled, and protected immediately. And I have here a, a, a nice photo from Samaro Enterprises, but I refer to the presentation uh, right after the coffee break by Mr. Myron Hillock. He will show you some great examples of uh, this technique. What about the concrete mix? Well, concrete roads and uh, heavy duty or, or industrial pavements, they have the same exposure, so they should have the same durability requirements. Uh, the strength requirements are also the same, uh, except maybe if it's a really light-duty pavement, but 
basically they are the same and the difference is more made in the thickness of the pavement rather than in the strength. Uh, also materials, sand, fine coarse aggregates, uh, cement, water and mixtures, they're mostly the same. Okay, there can be a difference. You can, while for a road, the polished stone value is really important to avoid the polishing of your stones at the surface. And because of the low intensity of uh, frequency of the traffic, that's not really necessary for industrial pavements. And also the basic principles for a good uh, concrete mix are the same. Well-graded aggregates, a low water cement ratio, not Enough water, but not too much. Enough to have a good workability, because you cannot solve everything with the admixtures. And, uh, and you need some water, so for a good workability, it also means that you have a relatively high cement content. But all those principles normally remain the same. In case of slip form paving, it's a, a dry mix. Consistency classes S1, S2. It gives the highest quality, and mostly it is air untrained. And thanks to the air entrainment, it resists the scaling due to the icing salts and free thaw effects. In contrast, the manual paving between fixed formworks, um, the best solution is to have a, a good workable mix in classes S2, S3. Then you already need a super plasticizer. It's difficult to have the compatibility with the air entrainment. Sometimes the air goes up too high, so often it is without air entrainment. So, but then you need to protect the uh, surface against scaling by the use of uh, sealing agents, uh, hydrophobic uh, impregnation products. You see here on, on, on the bottom a uh, concrete mix which is a bit too dry for manual pouring. Also a limited compaction with a very light uh, vibration bream. It's probably not enough to come to a, a good result. Again, for those large areas with pumped concrete, with the fluid concrete there, they use high dosages of super plasticizer, but that and make sure also uh, and creates a lot of air. It's not the fine air bubbles of the entrained air, we call it entrapped air, which is not good for durability. The sand content is higher, there is no air entrainer. It's a concrete with a higher shrinkage, which with more bleeding, and in general also with a lower quality. Again, I'm not saying that it always goes wrong, but as you can see here on this photo, you can see where is the, the good concrete, which is the bad concrete, and the good, the bad, and there's also the ugly. You see, that's sometimes the problems. If it goes wrong with that kind of pavements, then it goes totally wrong. Um, then, of course, then uh, the owner will regret to have chosen for this maybe cheaper solution, but not the best uh, quality. Uh, yeah, just a, a little table to show the influence of the compaction on the concrete strength. We have here uh, consistency, the slump in S2, S3, and two times S4. We have a vibrated and a non-vibrated concrete. And we see here the, the entrapped air, normally around 1%, and we see the compressive strengths at uh, 7 days, which are all around, uh, let's say, 31 to 34 uh, megapascal. If we look at the non-vibrated concrete, we see that the entrapped air goes up from 2 to uh, almost 4%, and that the compressive strength at 7 days already uh, shows a reduction of, of 15 to 20 percent uh, in comparison with a vibrated concrete. So it's not because it's a pumpable concrete that you don't have to compact it. No, you still have to remove the entrapped air that remains important. Uh, oh yeah, we come to the joints. Yeah. Of course, of course, the how to make joints. That's the same technique for roads and, and industrial pavements. When there's heavy traffic or heavy loading, we need the dowels. Dowels for uh, the load transfers. Dowels that can be placed on baskets or can be 
inserted in the fresh concrete with a dowel bore insert and insert extra tool on the slip form paver or they can build in in this uh, a transverse construction joint it's also possible and for heavy duty concrete pavements a technique that's sometimes used here in Belgium is to use uh, a two lift pavement so two layers with the same sometimes different mostly the same concrete mix and the dowels are here positioned in those longitudinal uh, grooves Now a dowel uh, still allows the, the movement of the joint, which is good and which is clear for a, uh, a road because it's mainly in one direction. Uh, but for an uh, industrial area, you have m movement in two directions. So there are also solutions. Uh, those are pictures from Danley from the UK with uh, diamond and, and trape trapezium. Uh, dowel which allows movement in two directions. I'm already over my time, so I'm so I'll speed a little bit up. The <laughs> longitudinal joints, uh, mostly we use the tie bars. You also have the keyway joint, the, uh, the sinus joints, but mm, I'm not so fond of them. I think the best way to provide low transfer in the longitudinal joint is also with, with, with thanks to the, the tie bars. Other types of joints, some of them come from the, uh, also the internal concrete floor. Sometimes you see them outside. Not always the best, but let's say that it is possible. So the Omega profiles in, in, uh, in steel or even the plastic uh, is, is also a, a good solution. Surface finishing depends on all the surface uh, characteristics. Uh, For concrete roads, we have all types of surface finishing. Exposed aggregate concrete is very popular here in Europe. Transverse or longitudinal tine, mainly in the US. But transverse brooming is, is applied, uh, let's say, on most surfaces. And that's also what is used uh, mainly for the industrial pavement. So the brooming, sometimes the troweling followed by the brooming. Don't forget about uh, the slip resistance, as we already said, uh, can be measured with the, the pendulum test. I also joined uh, an, an interesting document from Australia, slip resistance of polished concrete surfaces. You can find it on the internet. Um, and I have here uh, quickly a case of an out, an, a nice white uh, outdoor pavement uh, and a very nice architectural hospital in Kortrijk here in Belgium. But the problem was the people came out of the hospital, they were very healthy, and then the floor was too slippery, they fell, and they could come back. So they had to take measures. After all, that they, uh, the slip resistance was measured, and then they so had to polish, uh, let's say, uh, at least the horizontal grinding of the, the surface to make it rougher. So that brings it to the end of my presentation i could not tell all but you see here a whole list of documents from different countries with a lot of information uh, if ever anyone needs something you can always contact me and i can help you further so i all thank you here and at home for your kind attention I received a question in the meantime, I can say I did not mention the thin concrete pavement technique as an option. Yeah, th would this be a good option? I'm, I'm not so f very familiar with uh, thin concrete pavements, uh, and especially not for the, the uh, industrial pavements, so I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure about that. I don't have enough experience, let's say, to, to give, but uh, we'll try to find a good answer. And everything what I did not tell in my presentation <laughs> that will tell uh, Anna Bildens in her how to build durable heavy-duty pavements. Anne is consulting engineer and owner of her consultancy office, Abbey Roads. Thank you. So, uh, good afternoon from me too. As I have less time, I will not. I don't know if I will tell you everything, but uh, my goal is to um, tell you something about heavy-duty pavements 
and more in particular about um, some details you need to take into account, which are perhaps more special for the heavy duty pavements. I start with the design. So the design of heavy duty pavements is different as we have a much higher impact of the traffic going over it. So uh, the frequency can be different as Luke said before. And that makes that you need to take into account much more the type of soil you have and you need to take it really into account of your um, design. Also, the choice of material is important, as I will show you by some examples. Um, it is very tempting to go for the cheapest, but it can be, in the case of really heavy duty, a bad choice, because then it can last for some months even. So it doesn't need long time to be deteriorated. Dowels reinforcement, I will show you some, some uh, particular executions and, uh, and with some case studies to have you pointed at the details. But before going there, some more theoretical uh, approach. Um, how do we design or how do I design uh, rigid pavements? Most of the people use the Westergaard method and we calculate stresses in the concrete and uh, displacements at the bottom of your structure, in the corner of the slab, at the center of the slab and at the edge of the slab. We presume it's a dense liquid model, so you have always support of your pavement, of your concrete slab, in any cases, and we kind of make uh, the, the loads going down over the structure. At the left side you see the uh, flexible pavement, at the right side the rigid pavement, and even the right side is not really correct, but my drawing skills are that bad that I didn't dare to draw it myself. But at the right side you see the distribution of your stresses quite linear. In reality it will be even more in the, the concrete part, so at the surface distribution will be much larger and then it will go down um, to the bottom of your, your base layer, sub-base layer. When you're in a rigid pavement, you have your deformations at the, the, in the asphalt, which are accounted for. In the rigid pavement, we calculate stresses, and we see that those stresses do not come higher than the stresses you allow in your concrete. That's the second part you need to take into account. What do you allow? For the design, we work with a fatigue law, so we will look at the traffic which goes over during a certain period. As Luke said, 30 years is the aim, but it could be 15 years when you go for, for more heavy duty pavement. Could be that you don't reach that 30 years. Could also be for 50 years or even longer. Um, what is, uh, in addition, determining your impact of your load? You need, in a lot of times, you need to look at the impact of the adjacent wheels. Uh, when they are far away, don't matter. When the load is not too heavy, as in a truck, your second axle would not have an influence on the stresses due to the first axle. But when you're working with uh, reach stackers and things like that, you will need to take into account the second wheel, because that will also influence the stresses beneath the first wheel. I'll show you later what I want to say about the positioning of the wheels. But here you see already a table where you look at the wheel spacing uh, going from 0.3 meter to 4.8 meter. And you see when you have a really depth, uh, when you go deeper, the second wheel is having an influence on the first wheel. It can go up to almost twice, so can be really influencing uh, the, the stresses beneath the first wheel. Dynamic factors, look, talked about it, but uh, I think it's important to say when you go for reach stackers, when you go for the really heavy um, traffic and you really need uh, to have crosses, you really need to accelerate, decelerate, to break, to have uh, st really strong corners and things like that, then it could be interesting to have a dynamic factor. Mostly it goes up to 1.1, 1 to 1.4. Uh, if you really take everything in a, into account, you can go up to 2, but that's really a lot. But 1.1, 1 1.4 could be a good solution. 
And then you have the canalization and wondering, I come back to that later. What do we do when we design a pavement? We look at the highest load, we see how many times that load comes over the pavement and we design for that load. Could be that you have only once that heavy load, most of the times the loads will be distributed. As you can see here, I don't think you will be able to see the numbers, but this table shows you the frequency of the loading of a, a container. So it's not always fully loaded. Uh, if it contains clothes, it will not be as heavy as uh, if it contains wood or things like that. So it depends on what is in it and um, can also be empty in some cases. So that will determine your loads for your pavement. So it could be interesting not only to look at the most heaviest load, but also look at, at the distribution of loads on your pavement. To see the impact, I added the table two container loads. There you see, for example, the impact um, of the stacking arrangement. You start with stacking height one. Uh, you have a contact stress of 2.6. When you go up to eight, which is really high, but okay, up to eight, you see that that stress uh, becomes 12.4 megapascal. So really very important extra stresses which are uh, given on, onto your surface. So, I, I talked about the extra wheels to look at. Uh, when you see the um, load or the wheel distribution for uh, a reach tacker in this case, you see that you have the front axle. Those two wheels next to each other will definitely influence each other, so those need to be taken into account. When you go further away, the third wheel from the uh, front axle will have a very small influence. The fourth wheel will never influence the stresses which come under the first two. The rear axle or the steering axle, like you look at it, um, is uh, less uh, loaded, so those will almost never be taken into account as they will play a very low role. Why do I only look at the, or why do we only look at the main stresses? It is a semi-logarithmic uh, function that comes in, so only the large numbers take part in the, the calculation. I also show you this because this is really important to make a good design. What do you need to make a good design for your specific case? is all dimensions of your traffic, of your reach tacker. And by all dimensions, I mean the dimensions of the wheel, so the width, the, the length in relation then to your, your load, which it, it takes, uh, the distribution, how it is, uh, uh, which type it is, and then, uh, very important, the distribution of the load over the steering axle and the driving axle. So that is the information you need. So when you want to make a design, start with searching for this and, and then it will work out fine. This is another type where distribution is much more uh, equal over the different axles. And at the right side, you see the impact of, on the soil. I took it from a tractor, so it's the impact directly on the soil, but it's similar when you look at the impact of a reach tacker, for example, on your sole beneath your pavement. What do you see at the right side? You see three different tires with different uh, tire pressure going from 3 bar to 0.75 bar. And as you see, so the first three have the same load, but by diminishing the pressure, you will increase your surface and the, the influence to the bottom will be lower. So your tire pressure is playing a role in the distribution to the soil which is beneath. On the other hand, if your tire pressure stays the same, but your surface is increasing, like you have with a more heavy vehicle, um, the influence will go much deeper, will go um, at lower layers in your uh, soil. 
And that's an important issue to remember because with roads, we used to use a, a play test to check the bearing capacity of your soil. If we do the same with um, uh, heavy duty pavements, it could be that you only measure the top 10, top 20, 30 centimeter of your soil, but the influence is much deeper. So I always say my design, my design is made for the traffic which is um, applied, but assuming a good soil with a good bearing capacity and no settlements, because you really go deeper into the soil. So a better way to measure your soil bearing capacity, if you don't know anything of your soil, is measuring it by the Westergaard plate. Why? The Westergaard plate has a diameter of sev 760 millimeters, so yeah, almost a meter, so much larger than the plate we normally use in a road construction, uh, which makes that the, the Westergaard plate ma uh, measures the, the bearing capacity of your soil deeper, so have, uh, has a better um, idea how your soil will behave under the heavy loads. Wondering or channeling, I think these are the most extremes. To the left, a reach stacker just going around to a ship, taking the, the containers off and putting them randomly. It's not randomly, of course, but put it, putting them all over on, on the industrial pavement. Uh, even the way to the ship is not the same as it goes left, right uh, uh, to the ship. So it's really at random how it goes. The other side, airplanes, they aim at the line which is in the middle of the taxiway. Uh, so they always with their front wheel in the same lane. Depending on the type of aircraft, you will have an, a different influence, a uh, different width of your, your wheels, between your wheels. But all same type of airplanes will roll at the same area, so there's almost no wondering, it's only channeling. So, so that you need to take into account, and you need to take it into account for the whole pavement, which means that perhaps at the entrance of your industrial pavement, or at some, some passage there, the traffic can be much higher than um, at other parts of your pavement. Coming to some examples, um, we start with the airport of Zaventem, which uh, has an apron, or all the aprons are in concrete, a 40 centimeter thick doubled concrete pavement placed on the asphalt interlayer with uh, the advantages that uh, Luke showed you before on a lean concrete. So you have a very rigid structure, which means that there's a very nice distribution of your stresses and uh, the soil is less um, loaded by, by the aircraft. With concrete slabs, there's one problem. They are very, um, or they change their length with temperature. Uh, so you need or you don't need, it's always a discussion, expansion joints. If you don't put any expansion joints, you have a risk that the concrete will be pushed away and that your joints will open over time and that, that the, the, um, after some time you will have the adjacent asphalt coming up and things like that. But expansion joints are also difficult to place, especially if you want to place them during slip form paving. So um, therefore I recommend not to put too many. Just enough is a very good solution. Why do you need the expansion joints? I first go here. Um, expansion joints are needed to resist the expansion due to the homogeneous um, difference in temperature. So or the uniform temperature difference. So the average temperature of the, your concrete is playing a role there. Temperature gradient is taken into account in your design, but the uniform temperature uh, change is taken into account by your expansion joint. What is counteracting that expansion? That is the, the friction between your bottom layer of your concrete pavement, 
for example, and your base layer. For example, if you have your asphalt layer there, you will have an adherence with your base layer, so your friction between both will be higher and your concrete will be less tempted to widen, to open up. If you have a thicker concrete, you have more weight, so your resistance will be higher, so in that case also you will have less displacement at the end. The displacement is only over the active length, as you can see, so you see your stresses, you see the displacement, only over the active length, so it doesn't matter how much concrete you have in between, it's only over the last 100, 200, 300 meter that it will displace. You can calculate that, we did a thesis about that in uh, the University of Leuven, and uh, where they looked at the influence, for example, of an adjacent road, which is connected by, by dowels, which makes that from that side you cannot go open, uh, you, you need to stay with the, the roads which are perpendicular to it, and that has a large influence on the um, movement of your concrete. So I go back to Zaventem, what we did there, to avoid that we had to place two, three expansion joints to take all uh, possible expansion into account. We said, okay, we let's keep the last four lanes together. Make it a large concrete block, so in that way, when the movement will have to take place, it has to be for uh, the whole block, so you will have more weight which fights against it, you will have more friction, so the movement will be less. So you can see it here, I'm not sure you see it, but for those who are here, uh, here is the expansion joint, which goes over the whole uh, width of, of the, the apron. Here you have dowels in the longitudinal direction, and after the expansion joint, from there on, you have the normal uh, positioning, anchor bars and dowels are in this direction. So in the last four lanes we just switched dowels and tie bars, which makes that you have that group together and you have the weight of, of you have a lot, of, uh, not, uh, a lot of concrete in front of that expansion joint, which will avoid displacement. Another good position of placing your expansion joint is at the gutter. Uh, when you have the gutter, um, a reinforced gutter in this case, because otherwise it will not hold uh, the, the traffic, place at the side two expansion joints. It will avoid that the concrete will push on that gutter, so it will diminish the, the stresses in the gutter, but it will also give some space for the concrete to move. But expansion joints are not always nice things to place. This is the result of an expansion joint during concreting, so placed um, yeah, and, and let the slip form paper go over. And you see that the, the crack is here, which means that the expansion joint just moved, or the expansion plate just moved. And, uh, yeah, and that way you have a discontinuity and a crack above uh, the plate. They restored it, but not correctly. They should have restored it really at the place where it should be, because now you see here was a crack. They made the, rep uh, the restore, the repair, and then again you have the new crack, because here you still have the expansion joint at that place. So once it's displaced, it's not easy to do it again. So be, yeah, place them as little as possible, but at the end you need them. This is another airport at, uh, in Latvia, Riga, uh, where they used a very nice um, dowel system. So you see here in this case they have dowels in both directions. They keep the dowels in one direction quite far from the transverse joint in order to avoid any interaction between those dowels. Um, and they have... Um, so this is the result, so they're uh, quite... Uh, far from the, the, the joint. Uh, I thought I had a picture of the system, now I show it here. So what they do, it's a fixed framework, they put the dowels in and they had a kind of, of fixing mechanism at this side, so at the outside of uh, 
um, the concreting phase, where they kind of fixed the dowel, so that was really very perpendicular or very even, very uh, horizontal, and in a good direction, so that it was really perpendicular to the movement of the joint. They also worked on a geotextile, so the white here is a geotextile. They had one problem, it rained a lot the day before placing the concrete, so uh, the geotextile was completely soaked with water, which is not ideal, of course. Um, they, they pumped away the water, but it still gave some water going through the concrete to the top, but at the end it went okay. They overdid at some places, so here you see the gutter with the expansion joint at all sides. They wanted to place dowels here inside the gutter. Uh, it's not really meant to take dowels, uh, you have a lot of reinforcement in there, so it's not easy to put them in. And it's not really needed as it, as it has a very large uh, base layer also beneath, so the load transfer normally will be uh, good. What is especially not wanted is these two dowels at the side. Uh, these are way too close to each other, so that is really not a good solution. They didn't do it at the end, so that was good. What is really well done here is the sewing of the joints. They went to home almost half of the pavement, and that way they're sure their uh, joints will work. Of course, you cannot go to the half, because then you will so cut your, your dowels, so you need to be a bit higher, but they really respected the depth of at least one third and even a bit more uh, in the sockets. What they didn't respect was the geometry. This is not at the airport, but at the military base uh, also in Riga. Um, they had plates of seven meter and a half, only 20 six twenty seven centimeter thick and that is too thin for a seven meter and a half uh, a plate length and width um, and that was visible the first day it became drier and warmer so they had a lot of uh, saturation in the soil they had a problem with with the gutter so all this area was saturated with water and the first spring day, when it became warm, the water evaporated and you see uh, the curling coming into the slab, which is really, I mean, it's, it's three, three, four centimeter that it came up uh, in the morning. In the evening, it was gone again because then the water was evaporated and you had uh, the same hydraulic uh, um, or the same water content at the top as in the bottom. Come back to Belgium. Uh, this is a nice example of placing concrete uh, 40 centimeter thick in two layers. Um, they used the bottom layer, which was in this case with a fiber reinforced concrete, uh, to put the, the dowels in. So they made a, a kind of grooves in the first layer. So in that way, they were able to put their dowels at the transverse uh, joint very uh, precise. They were really very uh, really perpendicular to that transfer joint, so the positioning was perfect. And uh, then they placed so wet in wet the second layer on top of it. So you see here the two paving machines following very closely to, another, to each other, but giving time to put the dowels in between. What was the problem here? They were only allowed to cut the joints over a few centimeters. So the idea of the, the owner of the road was we don't want to cut too deep because if we cut too deep, more water will be able to come in and the, the crack will be wider and, and you will have problems perhaps with the corrosion of your dowels. So only cut over three, four centimeter with a thickness of 40 centimeter. It does not work. What was the result? You had cracks every four joints, more or less, there was a crack. You can see it here. In, the, in between, there were no cracks, but those cracks who were there were very open as the first uh, concrete was placed at 10, 15 degrees, and the second one at 25 degrees, something like that. So you had 15 degrees difference um, 
uh, no, it was reversed. The first was very warm, and then the second was much colder, so you had 15 degrees difference in, in temperature, and those cracks opened quite a lot. This is a pen which is placed in it, so it's really yeah, one centimeter, almost half centimeter opening of the crack. Shouldn't be a problem, you say, but then comes the second phase of concrete. So we had the first lanes placed, it cooled down, the second lane came, the, the joints opened. Of course, in the second phase, it's not really slip form paving. Uh, you, you have your fixed uh, framework, let's say, at the side, so the concrete can be a bit more fluid, and it just went into those joints. And what was the result? Every third, fourth crack, uh, joint, we saw crack like this, at a, a short distance, two, three centimeters from the longitudinal joint, in uh, the first phase of the concrete, which was poured. And it was just concrete, you see it at the right side here, you see the concrete which flew in into that crack opening, into the socket at the top. It's fixed, it's a hard part, so when it closes again, it just breaks open and, and you have the cracks in your concrete. So, uh, when you have a saw cut, make it deep enough that you're sure your joint will work. Joint filling material is also a question. It needs to resist whatever comes over the pavement. I think you always need it. If you don't have it, you need a very permeable base layer to be sure all the water will go away. Um, in this case, it was a very particular problem. We saw after some time that the joint material just came out. It was pushed outside or to the top. New uh, joint material was placed, very strong one. And you see here also, again, uh, dark spots pointing at water in the joint. This was the evolution. Uh, you see the water coming out and you see kind of uh, yeah, sandy, loamy, water, clay thing coming out. Of course, this soil is from the base layer beneath. It's just pushed up with the water. And uh, the problem was not the joint filling material. The problem was the base layer beneath. So in this case, it was... Uh, um, a reach tacker, so with, with container um, traffic going over it, very quite heavy. The soil they used was a sand cement soil um, where they unfortunately drove over a lot of times before placing the concrete. You see the result, it's very uneven, it's very loose, very much loose material or a lot of loose material at the surface. And uh, it's that loose material which is just pumped out by the, the reach tacker when it comes over. We just saw the water coming up. It's also completely uh, impermeable, so they took away some slabs. At the top you see it. It's no swimming pool, it's no pond, it's just water standing on the concrete or on the base layer. So here, when water came in, it stayed on that base layer, was just pumped out, and the base layer was so uh, erosive, was so um, the re it just went with it. So you get holes beneath the concrete and the concrete cracks and, and goes away. So I think when you look at those pavements, okay, it will cost more if you put that um, uh, asphalt interlayer, if you go for lean concrete beneath as a base layer, but at the end you will have much more uh, durable a uh, much more durable pavement and your lifetime will be much longer. So I think it's worth to make the good choices from the beginning to avoid those problems. Of course, you need to take into account the normal things of concrete, a good joint layout and execution. Uh, I just want to show you this. This is nothing in, in relation to, to heavy duty concrete. You can see them all over. These uh, lines you see here came after a winter. You see some deterioration. It is just by people doing their work too good. 
you have the workers uh, after the, the concrete slip form paver who are really toweling all the time. They really want to make it bright and shine, doing their best. What they actually do is bringing up the water and at that site, you have less resistance to the, the icing salts, to the free store uh, cycles. So they can make it flat. It needs to be even, of course, but they don't need to polish it that it, it's bright and shine because then you will have a problem with your frost resistance. This is just a bridge formed, so some concrete went over. In the old concrete, you had some holes. Of course, when there's um, expansion, those small pieces are, are, are not compressible, so they just push off the concrete at the, the other side also, so you get a very uh, weird uh, joint. So there, you need to cut it quite well. And then, of course, your joint layout, there are no uh, there's no magic. If you have a, a, a, an angle which is not correct, which is too small, you will have here the cracks coming into your concrete. So also there you need to take care, you need to have a look at the details. To end, um, some CRCP. So it's uh, one of the cases in Lanaken in Belgium where you have a container platform where they, it's a very long one, 650 meter long. So they, they thought, okay, it, it makes sense to make a CRCP with anchor locks at the beginning, at the end. And at the side, they, they placed a ring uh, beam, which I think is a good thing for CRCP. With um, slabs, it, it's not always keeping them together. It needs a lot of, it takes a lot of forces. But in this case, it's a really, it's a good solution. The advantage of the CRCP is that they can incorporate the rail quite easily. You don't need extra uh, reinforcement to do that. And uh, of course, it has a very high resistance to heavy traffic, as we will see in the next or in the presentation of Jeroen. And uh, no expansion joints and no maintenance of transfer joints. So quite nice uh, execution here and, and a very durable pavement. So I hope I gave you some more details on the heavy duty concrete pavements uh, to look at. To be sure to have a good design is to know your traffic which will go over, to know what type of uh, loading you will have and in what frequency. And uh, then of course uh, make sure that your soil is also of good quality because you have a much higher impact on roads. Uh, than road pavements. Structure, I would say as rigid as possible, pavement as well as base layer. In that way you avoid too much stress on your soil and you will have a longer lifetime for your pavement. So thank you for your attention. <laughs> Hi. Do you have any questions? What are requirements for smoothness for an airport pavement? Um, it depends which airport you have. Uh, in Belgium, you have uh, some military airports, American airports, and there they ask the, the or they demand the, the evenness, smoothness of your um, of the military rules in in the states. In Belgium, I don't think we have special requirements, so we we just have the same demands as we have on highways. I look at the people here if they contradict me, but the most stringent is, is that you have your, your edge really well. And I know in the States there are really particular demands on that, and that's a quite difficult one. You don't. Um, double alignment control through MIT and pavement thickness control. Is it usually required for airports? At this point, it is not required, so we don't have uh, extra demands on that. But um, yeah, the thickness is checked on, on course. Um, I think if, if uh, we have more ways to look at uh, the reinforcement, we will definitely use them. 
I'm not sure they will be there as a demand, but of course, if you have a problem, it will be much easier to look at, at uh, the placement of the reinforcement. That's mm -hmm. it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Um, Thank you very much. And <coughs> yeah, maybe it would will be interesting to have maybe a next workshop on all the non-destructive uh, techniques uh, and also on, on the use of the dowel since it's that important. But now let's go on with the presentation by Professor Halil Ceylan. He's Professor, Department of Civil Construction and Environmental Engineering at Iowa State University. Halil is a good friend of mine, and I'm sure he has a great presentation about stacked containers on uh, the impact on the design of roller compacted concrete industrial pavements. Today, we would like to deliver a presentation on analysis of critical load arrangements for stacked containers for the design of roller compacted concrete industrial pavement systems. I would like to acknowledge my outstanding colleagues and collaborators, Dr. Imin Shengun, research scholar, and Dr. Sang Wang Kim, research scientist. It has been a wonderful collaboration to work with them on this topic, and we greatly appreciate our colleague, Luke Renz, and the workshop organizing committee for kindly inviting us to share our research findings with you uh, as part of the workshop program. My research focuses on the analysis, design, construction, modeling, and performance evaluation of uh, transportation infrastructure systems. And uh, roller compacted concrete payments is one of the research focus area for my research team. And we've been working on this area for the past two decades. And we have a good number of publications and presentations on this topic, which you can easily find on the published literature. We greatly appreciate all the support provided for this study by the Turkish Scientific and Technological Research Council, TÜBİTAK, RCC Payment Council, Ankara Yıldırım Beyazıt University, and Iowa State University. We also greatly appreciate all the guidance and input provided by the members of the RCC Payment Council in the United States, particularly by our great colleagues, Fares Abdo and Corey Zollinger for this study. We also would like to acknowledge the contributions of Prosper Research team members at Iowa State University for this study. If you are interested in accessing our uh, research reports and learning more about our uh, projects and all that, you can actually visit the PROSPER website. You can see the link on top of the page here and a screenshot of the PROSPER website under the Institute for Transportation. We have a, a broad expertise uh, from modeling, performance evaluation, laboratory characterization, economic analysis, sustainability and resilience related studies and all that. And you can visit this website and learn more about what we do uh, and our presentations and presentations. As Prosper research team, uh, we have been very fortunate enough to get involved with over 130 research studies. We greatly appreciate all the support provided by our research sponsors. Uh, from Federal Aviation Administration, Federal Aviation Administration, NCHRP studies, state DOTs, uh, industry, Portland Cement Association, uh, CC Payment Council, uh, and all that. Uh, and we have a prolific research team with large number of publications and presentations. And our research work has been uh, cited by the uh, engineering uh, scientific uh, community. And our have attracted a uh, good number of uh, uh, media uh, attention and uh, you know there are several news articles if you google our team uh, you can access those please note that as a professor uh, I give quizzes to my students and today I have a few questions for you please keep track of your answers and let's see how you will be doing and the uh, question number one is here What's the payment engineer's favorite breakfast? And the answer is waffle slap pancakes. 
As part of our problem statement, uh, containers uh, transfer their loads to the payments through their footprint. When multiple containers are stacked, this small contact area results in a high payment surface stresses and may lead to depressions and cracking on the payment. This is true especially for asphalt flexible payment systems. As a result, roller compacted concrete payments uh, could be a, a great choice for highly concentrated loads like stack containers because they have high flexural, compressive, and shear strength. As the objectives of uh, this study, the initial phase of our long-term uh, effort on developing RCC payment design for stack containers is to identify container loading configurations that result in the greatest stresses and deformations in the payment system. To achieve this goal, we first discuss the critical load approaches used in existing design manuals uh, for container terminal payment systems. Then we analyze the critical container loads that cause maximum critical stresses and deformations using the ISLAP 2005 finite element software package. And this software package is specifically designed for simulating rigid payment uh, uh, structures. Part of the outline of this presentation, our talk will be in two parts. In the first part, we will briefly cover the design principles of payments for stack containers and limitations of existing design manuals. Then in the second part, we will detail our proposed RCC model and analysis of critical load arrangements for stack containers. Now, let's continue with item number one in our outline. With the increasing human population around the world, containers have been stacked up to eight high recently and become widespread in this way. Therefore, the payment designers should consider uh, stresses applied by container corner castings in designing the payment systems for container storage areas. In terms of design principles, to accurately calculate the stresses induced by static loads from containers, it is essential to consider the location and arrangement of the container loads in addition to their size and contact area. The container corner casting can be located interior, edge, or corner of the payment slabs. The container corner casting load arrangement can take different forms, such as single, dual, quadruple strip, uniform, or trapezoidal loads. These factors significantly affect the stresses generated on slabs and must be taken into consideration during payment design process. In rigid payment analysis, in general, three load locations are considered in design as critical points, which are internal, edge, and corner loadings. Because closed form formulas originally developed by Professor Westergaard at my alma mater, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, are applicable only to a very large slab with a single wheel load applied near the corner in the interior of a slab at a considerable distance from any edge and near the edge far from any corner. This load can be a wheel load of dynamic handling equipment or static container corner casting. As shown on this slide, the container casting load arrangements also have a significant impact on the design outputs. When concentrated static loads are in close proximity, the behavior of punching and flexile behavior can be significantly affected. Therefore, it is essential to pay more attention to reflecting the field container casting load configuration in the design model. If you look at the existing design manuals, they often construct container storage areas by assuming that critical loads or dynamic loads originate from container handling equipment such as rich stackers and straddle carriers. However, several existing design manuals, including the ones by British Port Association, Concrete Society TR34 methodology, French and Spanish methods, and ACI methodology. They consider stack container loads for payments. It is important to note that the ACI methodology does not focus on stack containers, but provides the allowable maximum loads for punching effect for concentrated loads, such as dolly wheels and sand shoes for semi-trailer legs or small areas. On this slide, you can see that the existing stack containers design manuals have limitations, with the biggest differences among them 
related to the locations and arrangements of container corner casting loads. The most important limitation of current design manuals is that they do not consider joints a critical and unique feature of rigid payments. Secondly, with the exception of the Concrete Society TR34 and ACI methodology, it is assumed that stack container loads are applied only on the inside of a slab far away from any edge or corner. Additionally, load arrangements are mostly assumed as a single load arrangement. However, these assumptions can significantly impact payment design and may result in divergence from realistic design. On the existing design manuals for container storage areas, both the British and French methodologies use finite element analysis. The British BPA method utilizes a design chart created with GeoStudio software to determine stresses and strains at critical locations, and the finite element model was calibrated using performance data from real payments. In contrast, the French method uses a software program called ALICE uh, version 2.1 2021, which is based on finite element modeling and Burmeister's classical solution of a multi-layer elastic system. However, both methods assume that the loads are applied only in the slab interior and do not consider edge and corner loading conditions or joint effects. On the other hand, one of the main difference between the two methods is that the BPA British and French LCPC methods apply critical container corner casting loads for each stacking arrangement based on the assumption of single and block loads on the payment, respectively. Our proposed design method is unique in that it is tailored to analyze rigid payment systems by taking into account joints and load transfers, which is not considered in existing design guidelines. This design guide enables designers to analyze and identify critical stresses arising from container loads, not only in the slab interior, but also in the more critical joint edges and corners. By considering these factors, our design guide can lead to the development of more realistic designs that consider more complex load transfers. Now we will continue with analysis of critical load arrangements for stack containers. We'll talk about the methodology and ISLAP 2005 finite element analysis. Now it's time for quiz number two. Why did the payment engineer go to a comedy club? And the answer is to learn some new jokes about concrete. As mentioned earlier, this study utilized ISLAP 2005 finite element analysis software to determine the critical load arrangements for stack containers. ISLAP 2005 was specifically designed to simulate rigid payment structures using the finite element methodology under traffic and climatic loads. And it is also used to calculate the rigid payment structural response in Ashtoware payment ME design software. Therefore, ISLAP 2005 is considered as a reliable analysis software for rigid payment systems. As mentioned in earlier slides, existing design manuals for stack containers do not take into consideration the joints effects for rigid payment designs. Moreover, they assume that loads are applied only in the slab interior. While the British method considers critical loads, which forms a single container corner casting to calculate critical stresses and strains, the French method takes into account the intersection of the four container corner castings as the critical load since the containers are assumed to be arranged in a block form. This study focused on determining critical stresses and deflections for a payment system that supports typical 20 feet containers place on a rigid plate with an assumed joint spacing of 5 meter by 5 meter. This is a typical joint spacing range slab dimensions in practice. This approach was taken into consideration to better simulate field stacking conditions where single row and block stacking arrangements are often combined as illustrated in the figure shown on this slide. 
to identify the slack container arrangement that will result in maximum stresses using the ISLAP 2005 financial elements software. Several steps were taken. As step one, first, the layer thicknesses and properties presented were selected based on typical RCC applications described in the literature. The average weight of a stack container was determined to be 156 kilonewton, and the loads from the container were calculated using a stacking height of five units for each layout. Here, we would like to reference the PINC Working Group Report 165, Design and Maintenance of container terminal payments, which was published in 2015. Please note that the, during the analysis, input parameters were kept constant. In step two, in contrast to the existing design manuals, joint design, which is joint load transfer efficiency, was taken into consideration during the analysis. As you may know, load transfer between joints for RCC payments is provided by aggregate interlock. And the ISLAP 2005 software uses the aggregate interlock factor, AGG value, to calculate the joint load transfer efficiency on payment response. The value of the AGG factor parameter is dependent on the stiffness of the joint, load transfer efficiency, and the modules of subgate reaction. You can see the equations to calculate the AGG and other parameters on this slide. Continuing with step two, as part of this project, we considered five different load transfer efficiency LT values, namely 0, 25, 50, 75, and 100% as variables to determine the stack container arrangement that will result in critical RCC payment responses, stresses. After determining layer thicknesses, properties, and joint design, the third step involved seeking stack container arrangements that will generate the maximum critical stresses for each selected percentage of load transfer efficiency. To accomplish this, we moved the load points in the X, transfers, and Y, longitudinal directions, by two inches in both directions, starting from zero, as shown in the figures on this slide. Step four. We then obtained transfers and longitudinal stresses, as well as deformations, for each case separately. Typical stress and deformation outputs obtained for X location zero and Y location zero values are seen here. This approach allowed us to identify the most critical stack container arrangements, which could be used to develop more realistic design guidelines. During this study, we conducted 16,800 financial month analysis simulations for each load transfer efficiency value, resulting in a total of 84,000 simulations. Finally, in step five, the critical stresses obtained from each simulation were combined using a special Python code to generate heat maps, namely counterplots, that identified critical stacked container arrangements resulting in highest stresses. At the end of our analysis, we found that for load transfer efficiency values of 0 and 25%, the joint edges where the container block arrangement is located uh, experience the maximum stresses. This information is crucial in helping us develop a design manual that can better withstand the stresses associated with stack container arrangements uh, in the future. Similar to the deflection load transfer efficiency values of 0 and 25%, for deflection LT values of 50 and 75%, the joint edges where the container block arrangement is located experience the maximum stresses, as shown in the figures on this slide. On the other hand, as the deflection load transfer efficiency value approaches 100%, it was observed that the critical stress occurs when two of the containers are on the joint and the other two are on the edge of the joint. This information is crucial in determining the optimum stack container arrangement for RCC payment design, as it enables the placement of containers in a way that minimizes the risk of payment failure due to high concentrated loads. In other words, 
if the payment thickness is designed for critical locations that cause maximum stresses, the risk of payment failure due to high concentrated loads will be minimized. As you can see from this chart, there's an increase in the maximum stresses as the percentage load transfer efficiency value decreases. When load transfer between adjacent slabs is not provided at all, we're talking about no load transfer efficiency, 0%, and full load transfer is provided, we're talking about 100% load transfer efficiency, maximum stress ratios increase by up to 58%, which can result in a need for thicker payment design. This finding highlights the importance of careful consideration of load transfer efficiency values ratios in RCC payment design, as it directly affects payment thickness for various stacking arrangements. Now we will continue with summary and future work. Well, it is time for quiz number three. Why did the Iowa payment engineer join the debate team? And the answer is, to argue the benefits of concrete over asphalt. In summary, the development of an RCC payment design for stack containers involves a multi-step process, beginning with the determination of the critical container load arrangement. Initially, we examined the existing design manuals that considered stack container design. Then, we conducted analysis of critical loading locations using the ISLAP 2005 Finite Element Program, a crucial step in creating a new design guide that considers the limitations of the current design manuals. Finally, the critical load arrangement or configuration for stack containers was determined. After completing the first two steps, the next step will involve parametric studies. These studies will be performed on the critical load configuration determined in the previous step by changing the layer thickness, layer properties, modules of subgate reaction values, stacking heights, and weights. The fourth step involves calculating the critical transverse and longitudinal stresses and maximum deflection for each case. In the fifth step, the transfer functions will be developed to determine the permissible stresses of the materials. The sixth step involves comparing the permissible stresses of the materials with the critical stresses caused by the container stacking. In the last step, the minimum payment layer thickness that satisfies the strength criteria will be determined and a design chart will be created based on the results. Studies on new payment design manuals for stack containers are ongoing. It is still important to compare the recommended payment thicknesses from existing design manuals for the progress of this process. For this purpose, a simple design example was selected. This container terminal will be used for commercial purposes and the average weight of each container is 15.6 ton. Stacking arrangement includes the height of five containers mix and the layout in the block. Subgate support condition is considered to be good with a CBR value of 5 or greater. For each method, the design inputs closest to the loading condition were tried to be selected. Many design guides primarily consider dynamic loads in payment design, so if you design a manual does not provide any design procedure for stack container design, we added X marked to the respective design guides. As you can see, these are payment systems obtained from our proposed design guides. We apologize for skipping the calculation process due to time limitations for this presentation. As seen on this slide, payment thickness can vary based on the partial safety factor. While safety factors provide security against all unknowns from the production of the PCC process to the end of the construction, it is not always possible to choose a greater safety factor. The decision should be based on the specific conditions and requirements of the project. As you know, direct comparisons of payment thicknesses are nearly impossible since material input and payment analysis procedures in various design manuals do not have comparable characteristics or approaches. Nevertheless, in order to clarify the comparison, 
we try to select the same concrete class where possible. RCC was not mentioned as an alternative surface layer in the BPA and TR34 concrete society design manuals. The current highway specifications and design guidelines which are updated in 2020 and 2022. The UK state that RCC can show similar performance as C35 slash 45 concrete class. So C35 slash 45 concrete class, which is believed to represent RCC material, was selected for analysis. As can be seen, BPA method and the Spanish method offered similar uh, thickness designs, while the TR34 method offered a thinner thickness. By the way, the Spanish method originally offered 3 cm less thickness than the table shown on this slide. But here, concrete grade C35 was used. So the design manual states that if you're going to use a concrete grade lower than C40, you need to add three centimeter to the slab thickness. Recommended model thicknesses match the current design guide thicknesses when compared to the proposed design model outcome. However, it offers thinner payment design system, especially when the factor of safety is less than 1.5. It is believed that one of the primary reasons for this is that ISLAB 2005 which is a specialized and calibrated tool for rigid payment analysis, can calculate payment stresses more realistically. It is important to note that the aforementioned findings were derived from our initial research and that the calibration studies have yet to be conducted and are currently under development. Is number four. What did the roller compacted concrete payment say when asked why it's so popular? And the answer is, I'm always on a roll. You can see my contact information on this slide. Uh, at any time, if you have any questions about this presentation or in general about roller compacted concrete payments, please feel free to drop me an email or give me a call and uh, we will be very happy to get back to you and answer your questions. Thank you for kindly joining today's workshop and uh, listening to our presentation. And if there are any questions or comments uh, during the uh, question and answer session, we will be very happy to answer your questions and uh, clarify anything that uh, is needed. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the workshop. Oops, I almost forgot to give the last quiz question. Why did the concrete slab go to the chiropractor? And the answer is to get its joints adjusted. Well, I hope you enjoyed my quiz questions. Thank you and stay well. We all en enjoyed your, your presentation <laughs> and I was happy to see that after so many calculations that at least you confirmed my advice and my presentation not to put those static loads on the joints. <laughs> uh, okay, I see that all the questions were already replied to in the chat box, so we can save a bit of time. So it's time here for a coffee break, also for you at home. So we go on with uh, our workshop. Uh, sorry for a little technical problem with my microphone. We continue with a presentation uh, by Myron Hillock, sales director of Summero Enterprises, a recent member of uh, UPAVE and manufacturer of very nice uh, machines and equipment, uh, especially for construction of these kind of industrial pavements. Good morning. I am pleased to join you here today by video to discuss a paradigm shift that is gaining significant momentum across North America and drastically reducing the cost of concrete paving projects. 
My name is Myron Hillick, and this is my 25th year with Samaro Enterprises. I became very passionate about concrete pavements in 1999, and even more so in 2001, when two concrete contractors schooled me on the vast opportunities in which 3D provides. That enthusiasm led to my appointments to the American Society of Concrete Contractors Concrete Paving Committee, which I later chaired and remain active on still today. I also was appointed to a few American Concrete Institute committees, including the ACI 330, which consists of two paving design guides and specifications. I co-authored the construction chapter on both of these documents. I am also a frequent speaker across North America on concrete paving opportunities and benefits. With the help of a few concrete contractors, I have also brought forth some of the products we are about to talk about today. All right. Let's get started on the reason we're here. There are a multitude of reasons for owners to decide upon concrete. I have listed several here. The top two, of course, are very obvious. But why safety? Well, the concrete texture helps significantly reduce slips, falls, and accidents, thus fewer lawsuits and legal fields. It is also a cooler surface as it does not raise the ambient temperature but ultimately concrete in many markets can and will edge out asphalt on initial first cost, or at a minimum, be less expensive than asphalt after the first or second fill and seal. So if the owner developer intends on holding this property, concrete is by far the least expensive alternative. How? Primarily the construction cost is less with concrete, plus all of the long-term benefits you see listed here. Let's take a look at paving applications. What types of projects are we seeing this form of integration? Well, initially it began with large pavement projects, primarily distribution centers, warehousing, and manufacturing facilities. However, since these larger projects, we have moved into other larger projects, such as shopping centers, and today we see it all the way down to parking lots you may work, shop, eat, or visit on a daily basis, from payments over 140,000 square meters all the way down to your local dentist office or fuel stop. I want to draw your attention to the photo in the lower right of the fuel station and convenience store. Notice the light reflectivity off the concrete. This offers a much safer shopping experience for you and your customers. It also takes significantly less lighting, which lowers operating costs to maintain this environment. With an understanding of the types of projects that 3D integration can be applied to, let's take a look at the process itself. 3D integrations begin with CAD, BIM, or VDC digital plans. Once the data is modeled, it is then shared to field personnel for grade verification, fine grading, forming, concrete placement, texturing, and finally the curing of concrete pavements. Ultimately, everyone works off the same model. So how does concrete paving become competitive on initial cost? Construction efficiency, and it starts right here in the office before any dirt is moved or concrete delivered. It begins with 3D modeling. This digital modeling is created, then exported to the tablets in the field via email, cloud syncing, or flash drives. Here, the office built model is used via the tablet to lay out the project on site or to verify grades and locations of existing structures that are in the proper locations. A variety of grading equipment can be utilized to fine grade the subgrade or to fine grade an optional sub-base material, if so added. These grading machines follow the 3D model on the tablet, which is located in the cab and control the machine's hydraulic systems. It's important to note, by utilizing the exact same profile for fine grading and screeding, concrete yields will be much more accurate thus further controlling costs. Here's an example of how tight the concrete yields can be. 
This was approximately 95 truckloads with an excess yield of 0.27%. As you can see, this was a distribution center for FedEx in Toledo, Ohio. Following the fine grading and final subgrade inspections, and the slab is ready to be poured, it is important to select the proper screening method and evaluate your personnel needs. The least amount of labor, physical effort, and greatest productivity results from the use of a laser-guided screed as pictured here. The size of screed needed depends on factors such as access, congestion, maneuverability, and daily pour size. The larger screeds typically handle pour sizes of 35 to 9,000 square meters per day. Of course, these methods can be deployed on smaller pours as well, as you see here with the smaller laser screed, which is ideally suited for 2,000 to 3,500 square meters per day. In 2020, Samaro introduced a new machine with the ability to texture and spray a curing agent in a single pass. Manually bowl floating with one or two individuals was still needed. However, within the past year, this machine has been equipped with a bowl float as well. The machine was added and updated, now eliminating the need for manual floating, thus further saving labor and cost. Today, with soft landing automation, one operator on this machine floats, textures, and applies a spray curing agent all in one pass, which takes approximately 20 seconds. As you can imagine, a tremendous savings and improvement in the technique. Multiple broom textures are available to satisfy any owner's expectations. After finishing and texturing operations are complete, it is essential that exposed surfaces be immediately cured to maintain moisture within the concrete. Any delay in applying and curing compound can result in plastic shrinkage, cracking, crazing, reduced surface strength, and reduced durability. This is a line pulled directly from the ACI 330-21 report and shows how this new technology greatly improves the quality as needed by the new application standards. Pictured here is an example of the surface drying too rapidly before a curing agent was applied. This is common on hot, sunny, windy, low humidity conditions and job sites. Low humidity exists in cold weather as well. Before closing, I wanted to show you a quick video of a laser screed and the new Broom and Cure machine working in tandem in action to show you the complete process. Working in tandem with a Samaro laser screed machine, your paving projects will be done faster than ever before. They will be done with fewer workers than ever before. And ultimately, the quality of the project will be better than ever before. At the end of the day, the paving market is being challenged to update its brooming and curing methods. Let ACI provide the knowledge for this update and let Samaro provide the machine to make it happen. The Samaro Broom and Cure. I sincerely thank you for the opportunity to share this technology with you here today. Please feel free to email me any questions you may have coming out of this presentation. I also welcome the opportunity to meet with you in person going forward to discuss these methods in greater detail. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon. <laughs> Hi, Myron. Thank you for this great, <laughs> fine presentation. Very much to the point. I think uh, it really showed it was really at its place because if we talk about uh, a workshop on best practices, I believe you showed really the best practices. And also thank you for reminding us the, the main arguments why uh, we should use uh, concrete pavements. I don't know if there are any questions have arrived. Um, um, 
No, I don't see them. No. We did not receive any questions, but maybe you want to add something, Myron? Just, just, just. Yep. yep. Okay. How's the audio now? Yeah. Okay. The three D technology started for Samaro in nineteen ninety nine. And that was, again, with all large industrial and, and large placements. Um, but as the presentation indicated, we're seeing it in work into smaller and smaller applications now as well. So the uh, the big block, I mean, a lot of the presentations uh, previously, we've seen slip forming, and that's a great method. Uh, the, the laser screen brings the opportunity for big block placements and fewer. So. Any questions? Be happy to uh, to take them. The main advan advantage of the three D working uh, laser guidance is that you can work with uh, different cross folds in in all directions, which is difficult to do with a slip form paper. Exactly. Uh, we can with with the three D modeling we can shape the the sub base and the top surface uh, in, in curvatures uh, rather than all in flat planes so it it, it really helps uh, with the uh, the flow of uh, of drainage and and other factors okay if there are no further questions myron i i thank you for, uh, very much uh, it was a great contribution and i hope that we will can meet in the future Thank you so much. Sounds good. Thank Take you. Care. Bye. For the final presentation of today, uh, we will welcome our uh, technical responsible, <laughs> Jeroen de Vries, our Dutch colleague, because uh, he's going to bring us the, the case of the CER, Container Exchange Route, in Rotterdam. And all, he also will uh, go deeper into the question, why choosing concrete for this particular project? As mentioned, uh, Luc, thank you for the introduction. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about the uh, container exchange route, the SER route. Um, and as a subtitle, we said a well-considered choice for a heavy-duty concrete pavement. And I think uh, when we look at the constructions that are trade-off later on in the presentation, this is really uh, a super heavy-duty concrete pavement. And everything that Luc taught us, uh, Anne taught us, and also parts from the presentation from the others are incorporated within this project, uh, as you will see. Uh, first of all, the container exchange route, uh, the SER, um, is placed on reclaimed land in the, uh, Rotterdam, Maasvlakte, the Netherlands. Um, first, there were some already existing uh, container terminals. Then we had uh, the reclaimed land that was um, the blue uh, part and the yellow part underneath for the people that are looking. Um, and that had to be uh, connected. For that, they made a, a, a kind of circular road to interconnect all the terminals that are already there, but also those that are coming to the future. Um, here you see that every terminal will be uh, connected. Uh, there's also an, a train uh, connection, so the, the containers can be exchanged on the train, uh, on the railroad. Um, and okay, uh, in all, uh, the container exchange route is a closed dual lane pavement of about 11.5 kilometers long. Um, there were also additional 5.5 kilometers of road to the terminal accesses. Uh, from the red dots you saw earlier to the terminal itself. 
and it's suited for deployment of multi-trailer systems and automated guided vehicles, AGVs. Um, just to give you a small impression, um, I have a, a video that we uh, can look at. Well, as you can see, uh, could see there's uh, quite a lot of sand, a lot of water, a lot of wind, um, and there are coming some uh, terminals uh, in in the future. Um, the container exchange route was uh, put on the on the market as a tender, based on the system engineering principle. principle. So it's uh, uh, totally incorporated every aspect of the whole uh, system. Uh, was engineered as a as part of it, and so is uh, uh, the the pavement itself, the share route as we call it, uh, also. It had to have a design life of at least 40 years, and there were some very strict demands on the design, the uh, availability, and the performance of the of the route. So, one of the things that is quite different than uh, normal is that uh, they had to be calculated with fully loaded vehicles. Um, temperature stresses had to be incorporated, well that's not that strange. Um, there ha also had to be an availability of minimum of 99%, 24-7, 365 days a year. Um, and that's a quite a high percentage of availability whenever Within the 40 years, you, have you may never come underneath 99%. There was a special uh, question about rotting. They absolutely didn't want any rotting. Um, and as we just saw, it's reclaimed land. That so it doesn't exist that long, so quite a challenge. And, and the total tender uh, looked at the total cost of ownership. So it's not just the construction not just the construction costs, but also the maintenance and the, the whole operation cost was taken in account. Uh, furthermore, there were some, some more detailed uh, uh, specifications that at least 50% of the load transfer had to be, of load had to be transferred at the joints, 95% uh, of strength and electricity modulus had to be used uh, when the calculations were done. The palm curve minor coefficients had to be smaller or equal to no, uh, 0 0.6. And the fatigue law was prescribed uh, with the exception of the, the last part. All in all, um, quite a challenge. Um, and when you look at how it was done, we look at the, the location again, and we see that the total uh, uh, construction was uh, uh, divided into sections, and every sections, uh, section had its own axle loads, axle movements, um, and also uh, his own specifications. The total uh, uh, road had to be a cross section, as we see on the right side, so it had to be at least uh, 10 meters wide, um, with a total construction width of 2.5 meters. And there had to be, uh, it had to be possible to pass uh, um, two different AGVs or vehicles at all time. Um, as mentioned, there is uh, uh, some rather heavy equipment moving along this uh, container exchange route. Um, as we can see right now, it's the multi-trailer system. It's a, a, a 
a, a tractor with about five uh, uh, containers that are pulled. Um, there are some automated guided vehicles, the AGVs. And there's also, and that was uh, a more special one, uh, the AGV rescue vehicle. Uh, as you can imagine, that when an AGV uh, stops somewhere around the route and breaks down, it has to be rescued. That would be done by an AGV rescue vehicle. As you can see, that it takes up the container. But when we look back at the cross section, we see that there is not that much room to put any wheel loads besides the, uh, the AGVs or the vehicles that are already there. So that puts some kind of stresses on the edges. As we've seen before, that, does, um, that it's, it's quite specific. When we look at the, the axle loads, um, we see that there was a, a, a, a few kinds. From the multi-trailer system, we had the axle load of the front axle, rear axle, the trailers, we have the loaded AGVs, and we have the rescue vehicle with a loaded uh, container on it. Now, well, uh, we saw uh, from on the how to calculate and what the impact is of the, the contact surface of a, of a tire and what it does to the wheel loads. Now, just to show how uh, uh, big those loads are, you see that the, uh, the wheel loads as a, a measurement in Newton per square millimeter, that a loaded AGV um, put on 1.5 Newton each square millimeter. So that's, that's quite some pressure. It's not just the actual load itself, but it's also the uh, uh, actual loads, the, the repeating actual loads, that were quite high. When we looked at the different sections, we see that some sections, uh, for instance, District Park 1, was up to 33.8 million axle loads during its calculated lifetime. Each, ex uh, each load uh, was at its maximum, so that's quite something. To start, there was a variant study and a choice of concept, but how do you define those. What, what are you taking into account and what will be left behind? Um, first we looked at uh, a way to uh, make it in concrete pavers. Um, but that was quite rapidly uh, discarded because of the, the concrete pavers that were already there, uh, especially with AGVs. We have some problems, the rotting, as we can see in the picture. So, concrete pavers was not a real option to consider. We looked at modular uh, pavements, um, as tested earlier. Um, quite interesting, uh, quite high, high quality, that can be made within a factory and placed outside. Um, but the problem was, uh, uh, the specifications were quite good. Just the application, the, the whole system, would be very, very expensive, especially for this heavy load on an 11.5 kilometers long road. So just because of the uh, financial uh, side of it, it was discarded also. We looked at asphalt, um, but as you can imagine, um, asphalt has some kind of a problem. Uh, we can see that, um, especially uh, uh, the problem with automated gated, guided vehicles. Um, as Anne already mentioned, they are always in the same track. And what that does to a pavement, we see in an aerial view of two uh, parts of a container terminal. On the left side, um, containers are exchanged with reed stackers, so they are manually driven. And here you see uh, no tire tracks, so there's always a small variation uh, of the driving lines. On the right side, you see the, the, the, the black lines from the AGVs. That part of the terminal was just um, operated by automated guided vehicle and they always drive and turn in exactly the same spot. Well, then you come to this again. 
So we had to discard the asphalt also. Um, then there is something um, we often use in the Netherlands, uh, especially on, on uh, terminals, and it's a kind of a hybrid pavement. It's a uh, porous, an open structure asphalt that is poured with uh, uh, no, cementious uh, material. So it, it's kind of an in-between. It has some flexibility, uh, but it also has some stiffness in it. Uh, because it's quite well used, uh, we took that uh, one in account, so it can withstand high loads, but with extra loads you'll see that the, the sub-base should be quite uh, significant. Um, and of course, um, what else uh, uh, we can look at is a concrete pavement. Um, always good when high loads uh, are there. Now here you can see the, the flexible top layer, what it does uh, on under real load. Um, now when we look at back at the presentation on head, I think this is even more clear. Um, with a flexible top layer on asphalt, you should have quite some uh, sub uh, base. On a semi-flexible paving system, the pressure is spread more evenly um, on a wider angle, so the sub base can be a uh, little less more. And on a rigid top layer, for instance concrete, uh, the angle is even more positive and we have even a smaller amount of base material to uh, incorporate. Um, just to come back to this, why was this important? Um, Everything that had to be moved along uh, 11 and a half uh, with the, the connections, uh, uh, it is uh, 17 kilometers in total. Um, it costs a lot of money. And so we looked at the, the moving of uh, construction materials or, or sand or earth or whatever to minimize it to um, uh, as much as possible. Um, Furthermore, we saw um, the uh, use of an asphalt uh, layer in between the sub-base and the top layer. Uh, we looked at it also, um, and especially on the influence of the thickness of the base layer and the adhesion. So you see in the, um, in the graph um, some uh, uh, variations between uh, a good binding, uh, uh, a low transfer between the two layers and the same layers without any bonding. And you see there is quite some difference. This, for, uh, by the way, was uh, um, calculated for dialed JPCP. Um, here you see um, some more uh, uh, calculations we made, and the conclusion was that just to spread the load, you would like to have some thicker concrete slab. But thicker concrete slabs do lower the stresses due to traffic, but they increase thermal stresses. And there is some optimum where um, when you make the construction too thick, um, the thermal stresses are the ones that are uh, uh, leading in the construction. So we, found, uh, we tried to look at the, the most optimal point. So, at the end, we made a trade-off with uh, uh, several different variations of constructions. First of all, we had the JC, uh, CP, JPCP uh, on different uh, subsoils. We had the CRCP also on uh, different uh, uh, foundations. And of course, we had the asphalt and what uh, here, yeah, uh, what it says asphalt, but we mean the hybrid version, so the the semi-flexible asphalt variation. And here you also see, for example, that uh, with the uh, semi-rigid uh, asphalt layer of 17 centimeters, you should have 80 uh, centimeters of uh, cement-treated base uh, in a CA10 category, just to uh, uh, uh, accommodate all the axle loads that were uh, should be placed there within the 40 years. 
Um, we made the trade-off for all of these uh, uh, variations based on, on uh, three things. First, we had the construction, the construction costs, so the primer, primary cost, um, and we gave it uh, a figure. It's a kind of an index. The lower the figure, the most efficient it was financially. Uh, yeah. Um, and furthermore, we introduced something like a robustness index. A robustness index was um, created because it's not just uh, uh, the calculation for over the lifespan of 40 years, but also um, what is the possibility that something goes wrong, that um, the quality may be influenced in a negative way. And here you see that uh, in this case, the higher the number, the better it was, that CRCP was the most efficient, and especially the CRCP on a lean uh, concrete foundation, and it was much better than, for instance, the same CRCP, but then placed on a cement treated base of a hydraulic stabilized base. That just has to do with the ability to assure the quality of the, the sub-base. Then we made um, some kind of a maintenance plan, uh, the determination of the maintenance costs. Maintenance costs um, is looking like looking into a glass bowl, but that's not totally true, as we can see. First, we made a maintenance schedule of about 40 years, uh, the 40 years lifespan, in which we said, okay, during those 40 years, when do we take the different measurements Deflection, skid resistance, evenness, and a visual inspection. Deflection to know what is the, the uh, rest lifespan of the, uh, the, ro uh, the, the uh, hardening of the, the concrete during time. Skid resistance just for safety, uh, the safety for the, the vehicles that are driving on it. Evenness measurements, also one of the uh, specifications that were very strict. And a visual inspection, how does the concrete uh, holds on, or how does the pavement holds on, because it still was a, a trade-off. This all ended up in a registration to the actual condition of the pavement, and gives an early insight into planable maintenance. It's also a recording of the technical condition in relation to the contract. So you always have data on how the pavement will perform at any time. After all, just measuring is knowing. Um, that was just the measuring part, uh, but there also has to do some maintenance, some prevent uh, preventive uh, maintenance, like joint fillings, whenever some joints are there. And there was um, a variation in corrective maintenance, like local repairs, for instance, uh, when you use concrete at punch outs. Um, for those, uh, um, for the, the determination, we made some literature, stu literature study from the CRW, uh, um, in which uh, multiple roads and different kind of roads are uh, monitored during the 80s and 90s. Um, and there was registered what kind of maintenance was done in what year of the lifespan. And that gave us some, uh, some interesting insights. Furthermore, we had some contact with the Ministry of Defense, uh, Gils Rijen Air Force Base at that moment, uh, just because they have some monitoring system within the defense organization, how to get the runways uh, in an optimal condition. And at every landing and takeoff, there is some influence in the rest lifespan of the construction and they register everything. So you know at any point what the rest lifespan uh, of the construction is. And of course, we looked at uh, Schiphol, um, Schiphol airport experiences. Um, well, whenever there are some heavy loads there, especially with the, the, the bigger planes. 
The conclusion uh, was quite interesting. Some were quite obvious, like maintenance of the joint filling after eight years and elf years, ele uh, 11 years. Why the uh, variation? Um, at the points, at the, uh, the intersections where was, uh, there was uh, very much traffic, we uh, would like to uh, maintain uh, the joint fillings after eight years. And just in a straight line, you can leave it uh, for at least 11 years. Another one um, that was very interesting and can be used in other for other kind of uh, um, trade-offs also, is that maintenance of concrete always takes place within the second half of its lifespan. Um, this is particularly interesting, not just here, but for every pavement. Is At this moment, everyone is looking at trying to uh, cut the cost as much as possible in the uh, application phase, yeah? when, uh, when the application uh, takes place. There is also another possibility, and looking at a kind of an investment um, when applying the, the concrete pavement. When you double the life uh, span, it only takes a fraction more material, so a fraction more cost. You move the uh, maintenance of the concrete, so the, the pop-outs and stuff like that, and the cracking to the second phase. So in this case, when you, for instance, uh, design for not for 40 years, but for 80 years, you could design 40 years almost maintenance-free almost because there's always some kind of variation. So a few percent of uh, uh, the square meters of, of concrete will be maintained, but you can shift it, you can play with it. It's a very interesting um, way to look at concrete pavements. Just make an investment when apl applying it and later on um, get the man money back. Um, Further on, we, we saw that uh, with concrete uh, and also with the um, uh, when we look at the trade-off and the determination of maintenance cost, we said, okay, with everything we look at, we try to minimize the risk of problems. So uh, in this case, even on the, uh, the construction works, the fire ducts, um, concrete was applied in exactly the same way. So it was just roll over the with a machine. And we had to uh, the initiation saw cuts that were uh, are seen lots of times in Belgium, uh, f about uh, one meter, one meter and a half from the both sides, so to initiate uh, a crack even in a CRCP. Well, all that came together in the maintenance schedule. That's uh, takes li uh, the lifespan of 40 years, that was asked. So you put for every year the maintenance, the, uh, the measurements, everything in costs. And after all, you can uh, monetize it. So here we have the maintenance part of the trade-off for the constructions. And right here you see that uh, uh, the better it is, the higher the number, the better it is. In this case, so also here in maintenance, uh, concrete and especially the CRCP was quite superior to the rest. In total, we added uh, all up and we had, uh, after all, two competitors. So it was both CRCP, um, one with the lean concrete and the other one with the hydraulic bounded uh, foundation. Now, when we look at the trade-off matrix for the total lifetime costs, um, we see that uh, this construction, the construction we traded off in asphalt, in J uh, JPCP and CRCP, uh, led to quite some differences. The asphalt variant and the JPCP variant were rather close to each other. We see for, in, uh, for asphalt has the lower construction costs, but an, an quite higher net present value maintenance costs. JPCP, just the other way around, just a little higher construction costs, 
but the net present value maintenance was just a little lower. So it, it adds up, it's almost the same. But with CSCP, we see that the construction costs are relatively okay, especially when you compare it to JPCP concrete, uh, but especially the net present value maintenance is 50%, about 50% of the normal uh, concrete slabs uh, and about 30% of an asphalt and uh, I still have to remind you that this is not a normal asphalt but the hybrid version. So the total cost of design life were in favor of the CRCP and that was uh, um, chosen therefore. When we look at the matrix for the calculated availability, um, here also we see that um, availability on average was possible for every uh, variant. But when we look at the minimal uh, value during those 40 years, we see big differences. 95% for asphalt, the hybrid uh, version of asphalt. 99 was asked, so that's uh, it's not okay. For JC, uh, JPCP, it was 96.6%, a bit better, but also not enough. And when you look at CRCP, you see that the minimal value of availability in 40 years is 99.5%. So the final construction offered, um, in this case, uh, 26 centimeters of CRCP uh, plus 10 centimeters just to be uh, uh, on the shore side, and that has to be uh, has to do with the lifespan uh, extension, as mentioned. Uh, 50 millimeter of uh, asphalt uh, uh, interlayer and uh, 45 centimeter lean concrete. The final assessment of the tender: um, the project was granted out of three final proposals. Um, one of what which was uh, the CRCP as uh, as offered as uh, shown, and the other two contractors uh, had an asphalt variant. Um, I think that the, um, the principal made quite a good choice because uh, uh, we showed them they have limited maintenance, excellent resistance to rotting, one of the main priorities uh, in case of safety, resistance to heavy traffic, and we saw that it was quite some, it, it's real heavy traffic. Uh, a limited amount of joints, so uh, uh, maintenance is relatively low, Minimum disturbance of the ongoing operations, and that is more or less the key factor. Uh, every minute uh, the route was not in use, cost a lot of money for uh, the operation. And so there was an excellent TCO, um, as mentioned, that, that those are the main reason of choice. Um, we asked the principal, uh, to uh, tell this story um, for us, because that's that's normally it's always better. Um, Mr. Mathieu de Ruiter, the technology manager of SER, uh, unfortunately didn't have the time. Uh, we prepared this presentation in, in quite a, a small amount of time, but um, he had some uh, uh, he had an interview earlier, and I could quote on it. So. Here you see why they, deci they decided uh, for a concrete uh, uh, variant. Uh, and here we see, as mentioned earlier, um, our own perspective, but also the perspective of the principal, that um, the demanded availability of 99% and even higher, 24-7, uh, was, uh, um, was very good. Um, a new asphalt layer every few years uh, was not an option. Well when you show what is possible, then the other one uh, is rapidly not interesting anymore. And the end result, a low maintenance uh, road suitable for carrying uh, the 50 ton axle weights um, of the AGVs. So all in all, I think um, it's, it's a well considered uh, uh, variant. Uh, I think, as mentioned in, uh, at the start, Every part of what was told earlier in the presentations by Anne, by Luc, and, and 
a little also well a, bi a bit um, takes uh, uh, comes together in this project well, thank you uh, for your attention and I don't know whether there are some questions yeah thank you. yeah I see them um, Mark has a question. You know, the thermal stresses increase with pavement thickness. Is this uh, uh, for greater thickness? Uh, sorry? Yeah, it's also, we, we had to take it in consideration. Um, it yeah, sorry. Can, can you put it up again, uh, Elise? Um, Mark says, okay, you know that thermal stresses increase with pavement thickness. This is certainly true for concrete surface layers up to uh, uh, 175, 200 millimeter thick, where temperature difference and gradient increase with the slab thickness. However, for greater thicknesses, studies seem to show that the temperature difference top to bottom changes little with thickness, which results in lower temperature and moisture gradients. Delta T, uh, T per unit thickness decrease. Further, the increased thickness reduces the stress that results from any load, whether temperature or applied. Um, well, as, as I already said here for the audience, but um, it was prescribed. Uh, so we had to take it into account and it was not possible to argue with it. So, and we have some a question from I may have missed the answer during the presentation. Could you please explain how you calculated the robustness index um, and what parameters were used? Um, it's, ra it's an index we introduced, um, but and we, we calculated it from various things. But it's a, a rather, uh, how you call it, um, it's the way you look at things. So we had some kind of, of, of risk analysis. So uh, what is the risk on certain parts? Um, how big do we assess those risks? What is the impact financially during those 40 years? What can we do to prevent them? What are the costs? And afterwards you get some uh, an, an, a value of rest risk. Uh, now and those rest risks were added up and put into uh, uh, an index. I'll have to look it up how it was exactly. I have that, that uh, I don't have it in top of mind anymore. It was uh, executed uh, in, in 2017, 18, I think. So when you want, I can uh, react on that uh, by email or later on. Yep. Yeah, Luke. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll repeat the question because I think the mic is, is closed for you. But um, how can JPCP be uh, uh, uh, lower in in? Um, sorry. Oh, sorry. Higher in cost uh, in relation to uh, the CRCP. I think it had to do with the thickness. Um, uh, especially the, the foundation, the, um, but also uh, the, there were lots of uh, joints and the joint filling, every joint had to be filled. And that also adds up when you have in total uh, uh, about 17 kilometers. So it was relatively a uh, thin layer of CRCP. Um, steel prices weren't that high uh, as they are right now, but yeah. All in all, the t in total construction, um, you see uh, that it was it was a bit uh, a bit higher. Yeah. So, Stefan. Um, I have a question. Uh, that the, uh, who made the study on the top? Who made the study? Yeah. Uh, back then, I I uh, uh, I was one of the people that made the study. Yeah. Um, yes, it was considered, but it was, uh, I didn't mention it here. Um, 
due to the, the uh, uh, strict uh, evenness uh, that w had to be achieved, RCC was, uh, was not an option, no. So it, there has to be an evenness of uh, a maximum of three millimeters. So it was quite, quite flat, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, how? How? Yeah. I'll, I'll try to repeat it. But the question is, um, how does uh, a tender like this works? Um, uh, there are different offers. Um, it's it's functional prescribed. So it just says uh, what it should do within uh, the 40 years. So uh, they give you the the boundaries of where you have to be uh, within, and how you reach them you can uh, look for yourself. So uh, then you see that every contractor will uh, has his own IDs, but all, uh, also has his own specialties. And they try to incorporate, uh, incorporate the specialties and the knowledge and try to uh, make it as close as possible to the prescription and, and on the positive side of the prescription. In even even the, the the the time that the uh, the share was out of uh, order for service was priced. So every minute that it was not available, there was some kind of uh, of a fee. And and that that all uh, the the uh, execution costs, um, the construction costs, uh, maintenance costs, but also the the minutes during those 40 years that is out of service is also priced. When you add all up, then you have the, the most interesting um, combination for the, for the principal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Yeah, thank you, Jeroen, for this nice final presentation. Bringing us to the end of uh, this uh, workshop, workshop on the outdoor industrial and heavy duty concrete pavements. As I said in my introduction, we forgot them for some years, but so it was time to do something about it. I think we did it in a, in, in a good way. We had uh, some fine presentations, a few more general ones and other ones going really deeper into the detail of the technical design, but also in construction and giving some uh, recommendations on how to do it, how not to do it. So that's why I would like to thank all the speakers for the great efforts in preparing their presentation. Uh, it was uh, a hard task, but it ended up very well. Their willingness to share all those experiences uh, with us. I thank you all here in the meeting room and at home uh, for uh, attending our workshop. A special thank uh, to our members and partners of UPAVE for all the support to our association. So this uh, closes our workshop. Uh, nicely in time. I hope that we can meet again at uh, one of our next events. I think the next big event, obviously, that's our 14th International Symposium on Concrete Roads, which will be held from 25 to 28 June in Krakow, Poland. We hope to see you there. But also later uh, this year, there will be a workshop uh, in Belgium, Kortrijk, at the, uh, at the Mat Expo. Uh, exhibition, but that will not be a hybrid one, that's a live one. And there will be another one during the World Road Congress in Prague. Uh, so still a busy year to go. And next year we'll have uh, our next best practices technical workshop. So we start thinking about uh, good and uh, interesting topics for that next one. So thank you all and see you later. Bye. <laughs>